morning and welcome to Roebuck Presbyterian Church. We are glad you are here with us in person or online. Just a few announcements for you this morning. Uh, remember the session meeting tonight at 515 uh, to be in prayer for, for the elders as they, as they gather to meet this uh, tonight. Um, also tonight for our evening service we will be having a time of singing and reading of our favorite uh, hymns and carols with donuts and coffee afterwards. Uh, and do also remember the next week at 6 p.m., uh, the children's Christmas program with the family night supper afterward as well. Uh, also for the Roebuck Elementary School gift wrapping that, we, that has been mentioned, uh, those need to be in today. Uh, if you did not bring one this morning, uh, then it can be brought tonight. Uh, and be sure that you bring it wrapped with the tag as well. And then next week as well, we are also going to be observing the Lord's Supper uh, before the Sunday before Christmas. And uh, I also want to extend a warm welcome to the family of Graham and Jennifer Brooks as we celebrate, as we do the baptism of Samuel Brooks this morning. Uh, so we're, we're glad to be able to, to do this and, and uh, thankful for the Lord's provision and kindness even there. And with that, that concludes our announcements this morning. I invite you to turn to the front of your bulletin to read and respond to the call to worship found from Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 19. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in in his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that, At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land. Where they have suffered shame. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for bringing us into your presence this day, as in this time we remember the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into this world to procure a salvation for us that only he could accomplish by the shedding of his own blood for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, O Christ, that in him we might have full communion uh, with you in glory one day. And that as we enter in your presence now, that we might enjoy even a small taste of that glorious communion with Christ in, uh, today, now. Teach us, O oh Lord, more of what it is to have that heavenly mind to look forward to the coming, the second advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to do so even as you taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, God, take your hymnals in hand and turn to him 218. Angels from the realms of glory, him 218. Stand with me as we sing.
confess our faith together found in the Apostles' Creed. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. the deacons to come forward to collect this morning's tithes and offerings. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we bless you because you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are blessed forever and ever. To you belongs the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. We adore you because you are merciful and patient. You show loving kindness. You are long-suffering and you show covenant faithfulness throughout the ages. So to yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted 
as head above all. And we praise you and thank you because in your hand are power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. So, Father, we pray then that you would take these gifts and that you would prosper them. That you would use them and bless them abundantly and multiply them to advance your kingdom, to do your will, for us to do the work here as a church that you have called us to do. Bless the service that we would give you as your people. Grant that we will be profitable servants and that by the means you ordain and of course above all by your sovereignty uh, that your kingdom would come for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And Father, we would ask this morning you would be mindful of those who have suffered over the past few days, especially those in Kentucky, those who have lost much and those who stand greatly in your need. We thank you for your providence and your care. We thank you for your sufficiency, and we pray it would be known during this time to those who suffer. So receive our thanks, and thank you for your mercies, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And continue worshiping together. Let's sing hymn 213, What Child Is This? Hymn 213. We have printed there Philippians 4, 4 through 9, which highlight the virtues that God forms among his people, the virtues that should characterize us as the people of God. So we'll read the passage together, and that will give us opportunity to then confess our sins. So let's read Philippians 4, 4 through 9 together. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, 
Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray silently for a moment. Father in heaven, you give us much in your word to consider as we come to you to confess our sins and pray for your sanctifying and changing grace. Father, we would confess and ask for you to forgive us for when we do not rejoice, when we do not exercise gentleness, especially in how we react to trying circumstances, when we are not mindful of your coming, your nearness, your presence. Lord, forgive us for when we are anxious, when we're turning over in our head how we can govern our circumstances and, and make everything safe and right rather than coming to you and bringing our prayers and petitions to you with thanksgiving. To forgive us for when we don't pray or when we don't trust you or when we don't give thanks. And forgive us, Lord, also for when our minds aren't characterized by truth, nobility, things that are right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Lord, please forgive us of those sins. And we pray today that you, by your word, by these ordinary tools, these ordinary instruments and means, that you would make us holy, that we'd see the glory of God in the face of Christ, that we'd see the beauty of your holiness, that we would adore it and be transformed by it, and by your grace, become more like Christ and walk closer to him. Forgive us of our sins, sanctify us by your grace, and thank you for the mercies that are new every morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And hear God's word of pardon to those who repent and trust. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Amen.
thank you, choir. Turn with me, please, this morning to Revelation chapter 1, towards the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1. Maybe you're hearing that and wondering, Revelation, that doesn't sound much like Christmas. Well, we'll try to make the connection clear as we go through the passage. Of course, we have the privilege today of baptizing Samuel after uh, the preaching of the word. And before we do that, I'll make just a comment about uh, baptism as well. But I did want to continue with the Advent theme uh, for the preaching time. So we come to Revelation chapter 1 this morning. I'm going to read verses 9 through 20. And before I read, let's seek God for his help. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we are thankful that we can come to you and that we can hear your word. We have heard it already. We've read it and we've prayed both the word itself and on the basis of your word. We've sang songs that are based on your word. And now we come to read and preach again. So bless that we will, as we always pray, have eyes to see, to see the risen Christ, see him by the eyes of faith as he's revealed in the word, ears to hear his message, uh, wills that will respond with faith and obedience, and all of this for the glory of God. So bless now, we pray, give us grace too. Our hearts are hungry, we have needs, and we pray that you would meet them through your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 1, beginning at verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands is this, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. What do you want for Christmas? Have you been asked that or maybe you've been asked that over the past few weeks? And depending on your age, depending on your temperament, maybe you can respond with a rather detailed or long list. But maybe at other times you find yourself saying, you know, I just can't think of anything I need. And the person that gives you the look that says, really, do you have to be so difficult? I mean, just give me something. But whether you can think of something material that you want or need this time of year, there is something that all of us need for Christmas year after year. And it's something that the cultural and the commercial Christmases cannot provide. And that is, as we prayed a minute ago, eyes to see the beauty and ears to hear the message of the risen and glorified Christ. And that is something that scripture provides. You'll never go and miss that gift if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Well, in the passage we read today, Revelation 1, we find John exiled on the island of Patmos. And in that situation, he receives a commission from the risen Lord Jesus 
to record the visions that we know as the book of Revelation. John has been exiled to Patmos for preaching the word of God and testifying about Jesus. He finds himself exiled. He finds himself suffering the consequences of a society that is hostile to Jesus. And in those conditions of personal suffering, that is where the risen and glorified Christ appears to him and speaks these words of victory and hope. So therefore, while Revelation may not be the first book that comes to mind when you think of Christmas sermons, we won't find shepherds here in the field or anything like that. Nonetheless, the verses we've just read, they're very applicable to the Advent season. You see, we celebrate at Advent the coming of the light into the darkness, the arrival of the fulfillment of God's promises, the revealing of God's purposes that were glimpsed from Afar, the baby that was born at Christmas is now revealed for all to see. Here in Revelation 1, we get the glorious revelation of his light and majesty. We see who that baby really is as we read and study this passage this morning. And furthermore, just as this vision came to John in a period of suffering, so God's good news often comes to us when we need it the most. It was a dark time when Christmas came for the very first time. And perhaps for some of you, this time of year brings to mind some personal sadness. Or perhaps you're troubled by what you go, what the ongoing events that you see happening in our world. Perhaps you view yourself as living in the midst of a hostile society or a hostile family. Because of your faith, you have needs that only the Christ of Christmas can meet. And so therefore, what we'll see in this passage is, well, what we need. And what we need more than anything else is to see and hear the glorified Christ. So let's go through this passage this morning, and it will show us that Christ in three dimensions. And here's the first. First, Christ gives us hope. When we suffer, that's what you need. You need to see and hear that message. And the first part is that Christ gives us hope when we suffer. Now, I've already made reference to the circumstances that John is in, what landed him in exile here on the island of Patmos. Again, verse 9, I like the NLT's translation here. It says, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God. And for my testimony about Jesus, John, through his words and actions, gave positive testimony on behalf of Christ. In fact, the word testimony has a legal connotation. John bore witness. He gave evidence in favor of Christ. But the world's courts, the world system, has testified against Christ. They have testified against Christians, and they have exiled John for being one of his witnesses. Their society did not view Christianity as helpful or good for society. Christians were viewed as obstinate and, and troublemakers. Why can't you just offer this incense to the emperor? What's the big deal? John wouldn't do it until he finds himself in exile here on the island of Patmos, a small, rocky, volcanic island in the Aegean Sea. But despite such circumstances, Jesus has furnished John with a hope that endures in his sufferings. So notice how John describes himself again at the beginning of verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Yes, John acknowledges that he's suffering. He doesn't deny it. But at the same time, he acknowledges he is participating in the kingdom. So just as Jesus' advent, the coming of his kingdom, does not fully eradicate evil. We talked about that in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Well, the flip side is true too. The suffering of God's people does not diminish their participation in God's kingdom. 
Both are true. Both run side by side throughout human history. And in fact, one of the lessons that Revelation drives home over and over again is that your hidden reality, what the world can't see, that you're a member of Christ's kingdom, that you're alive and reigning with him, Revelation says that's actually your ultimate identity. That overcomes, that trumps anything you experience in terms of suffering. And so because of the ultimate reality, John can say, I also patiently endure. I suffer, but I'm in the kingdom, and so I patiently endure. Greg Beale writes, Faithful endurance through tribulation is the means by which one reigns in the present with Jesus. We often think of those as opposites, reigning but enduring. No, he goes, you reign by enduring with Jesus in your circumstances. And John includes you and me in those circumstances. He says, I'm your brother, I'm your companion in these things. And in some literature, the word companion, it's used for a business partner. John's readers share the same identity with John. Why? Because they are all united to Jesus Christ. Notice that in Jesus phrase at the end of verse 9. God's people may be in exile, but they are also in Jesus. And that gives you hope when you suffer. And notice one more instance of this tension that John identifies. He writes in verse 10, On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So John was on the island of Patmos, but he was also in the Spirit. And that phrase, in the Spirit, it could mean that John experienced some kind of trance when he saw these visions. It could also simply mean that he was worshiping when Jesus revealed these things to him. And regardless, the encouraging truth is that being physically removed from Roman society did not remove John from the Lord's presence. He could still be in the Spirit on the Lord's day, whether he was in Rome, Ephesus, Patmos, or anywhere else for that matter. And that's a good reminder that when our circumstances make us feel far from God, he is not actually far from us. He is not remote. We can access his presence wherever we are. And so that's an encouraging message. Let's come to the second dimension then of this vision, which is that Christ shows us beauty when we are startled. Christ shows us beauty when we are startled. And we'll look now at the actual vision in verses 12 through 16. This will take up most of our time this morning. It was this vision that first captured my attention, made me want to preach this passage at Christmas. Who is the Christ that we celebrate? It is the Jesus of this vision. So as we just saw in verse 10, John is in the spirit when he's startled by a loud voice behind him. Again, I think the NLT gets this really well. The, the second half of verse 10, John says, suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. So have you ever had someone barge in on you when your mind was somewhere else? Maybe make you jump, made, made, made you startle. You get that feeling when you read this verse. John is worshiping. And suddenly Jesus comes up behind him and starts talking to him. But not with a soft, gentle voice, with a booming voice like a trumpet. And what does Jesus say to him? We read in verse 11, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, Smyrna, etc., the seven that are listed there. Jesus instructs John, write down what you see, write down what you hear, and then send it to these churches. So what we have in this book is what John saw and heard and sent out to the churches. Now these were seven geographical, concrete churches. They were probably chosen because they occupied main stops on the common postal route of the time. And they were important urban centers. So there were actual congregations that would worship in those cities. They would get this message and it would go out to the surrounding areas. But as the rest of Revelation makes clear, 
The number seven often represents totality or completion. So these seven churches represent the whole church, all of the church, through time and space, which means that this is a message for us as well. And as we will see when we get to Jesus' explanation of the vision, this message primarily concerns God's care for his churches. So concerning that vision, after John is startled by the trumpet-like voice of Jesus, he does what probably most of us would do if someone was booming like that behind us. He turns around to see, who is this that's talking to me? And what he sees is a vision of Jesus that, while it requires some explanation, is one of the most beautiful and powerful visions of Christ in the New Testament. So let's unpack this vision together. Starting with the second half of verse 12. John says, When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Now I want to give you good news about Revelation. Many of the visions in this book are actually explained within the book. Or they're explained by something from the Old Testament. So often we think of Revelation as mysterious and hard to understand, and it does have difficulties. It's not as hard as we sometimes make it out. And so a good study Bible or a commentary will tell you, look, here's where the symbol first occurs in the Old Testament, so here's how you can make sense of it. And we'll try to bring some of that into our explanation today. So starting with lampstands, where have we seen lampstands in the Bible before? Well, they were a part of the Old Testament temple furniture. There was a lampstand there in the holy place. And you may know that in Zechariah 4, when Israel is rebuilding the temple, Zechariah is given a vision of a lampstand with seven lamps being furnished with oil. And remember, Zechariah's job was encouraging those Israelites, let's rebuild the temple, let's get back to our mission, let's be God's presence in the world again. And this vision assures him, Israel, you will be my witness, you will be my light, you will be that because I'll furnish you with oil, I'll furnish you with my spirit, and you will rebuild that temple and you'll be my lampstand. You'll be my light. You'll be my presence in the world again. Well, God is telling us that we have the same job to do. The end of verse 20 tells us the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We fulfill that same role of being God's presence in the world. And what enables us to fulfill that mission? Christ's presence among the churches. We are the lampstands, and he walks among us so that we can do our job. Now, how else does the vision present Jesus? What kind of Jesus walks among us? Well, verse 13 describes him as someone like a son of man. And that phrase, son of man, is taken from Daniel 7. And that vision long ago, Daniel saw one like a son of man, who was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and rules over the nations. So the son of man is a kingly figure. And yet also in Daniel 7, we see the son of man is also one who suffers. He identifies with God's people, and he suffers for them, and they suffer for him, and then they reign, and he reigns, because they're all connected together. And I know that may sound a little complex, but the idea there is simply, this Son of Man is our sovereign, and he's our representative. He will suffer and reign, we will suffer and reign in him, he is our King and Lord. But how else is he described? Well, John says the Son of Man is dressed with a robe reaching down to his feet and a golden sash around his chest. Now, this is clothing worn by the Jewish high priest. So not only is Jesus our king, but he is also our priest. 
And walking among the lampstands, he's doing his priestly work. The priest's job were to tend the lampstands, to trim them, and to make sure that they were always burning. Our king, our priest, takes care of his churches. Move on to verse 14, where John again reaches into Daniel 7 for some of this imagery. We read that the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. So back in Daniel 7, before the Son of Man shows up, we are first shown the Ancient of Days, whose clothing is as white as snow, whose hair is white like wool, who sits on a throne that is flaming with fire, and all of its wheels are ablaze. So here's this ancient of days. He sits down on a throne and he's worshipped and he exercises judgment. Now follow me here. That is unmistakably an image for God. But then the Son of Man comes to the ancient of days and get this, the Son of Man also sounds like God. He rides on the clouds of heaven. So we have the Son of Man who's mortal. He's going to suffer. And yet he's also divine. He rides on the clouds of heaven. And when he comes to the Ancient of Days, the Ancient of Days says, All right, Son of Man, you rule on my behalf. You judge on my behalf. You know what John and Jesus are doing here in Revelation 1? They're just taking all those images and throwing them into the same bag. This Jesus is divine. This Jesus is human. He died and came to life again, but he is God manifested in the flesh, and he has received the right to exercise judgment on earth, and he will exercise that judgment on behalf of his people by reigning from their midst. And friends, if that is not reason for comfort and joy, I don't know what is, but we're not done yet. John says in verse 15, his feet. We're like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Bronzed feet probably communicates moral purity, the fire there. The voice like rushing waters. That's like a falling waterfall or a rushing river. So it's loud, it's divine, it's authoritative. In verse 16 we read, In his right hand he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Just like the loud voice, the sword coming from his mouth indicates an authority. Authority that Jesus will use to execute judgment on unbelievers and, if necessary, to discipline believers who compromise with the world. See Revelation 2 and 3. The shining face is taken from Judges 5. It depicts Jesus as a victorious warrior. And again, we would ask, okay, on whose behalf does Jesus execute this authority? What's the significance of this mighty warrior? Again, the beginning of verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And verse 20 tells us those seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. It just reinforces the idea that Jesus exercises his reign on behalf of his people. He walks among the lampstands. He holds them in his strong right hand. He cares for them. He governs them. He meets their greatest needs. And that is the beauty that John saw. When he turned around to see that voice that had boomed and startled him. In his darkness, John needed light, and Jesus gave it to him. And in your hard times, you need to see with the eyes of faith who Jesus is on your behalf. That he is your king. That he is your priest. That he rules over you for his glory and for your good. And in all of our circumstances, we need to adore this Jesus and cling to him and worship him. And let's come then to the third dimension where Christ drives it all home. And that is this, that Christ tells us good news when we fear. 
the vision of Revelation 1, it follows a regular pattern of visions in the Bible. You have the vision itself, what we just saw, and then the seer's response, and then the interpretation of the vision. Well, in verse 7, we see the response, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And that's a pretty common response to visions in the Bible. And on one level, it's completely appropriate. How would any of us react? If we saw such a glorious display, it would shake us to our core. But despite the fact that Jesus began this vision with a booming voice, he now speaks gently to John. Second half of verse 17. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death. And Hades, three quick questions I want to answer in this last section. First, who is this Jesus? We've already seen a good bit of who he is, but he drives it home with this phrase, I am the first and the last. And that is a description of God. It comes right out of Isaiah, and Jesus applies it to himself. Jesus highlights, I am sovereign over history. Nothing comes before me, nothing comes after me. I am the one who will bring everything in between to its climax. I will bring it to its purposes in judgment and salvation. What moves human history? Jesus says, I drive human history. And I achieve my purposes no matter how bad things may seem. Second, how did Jesus get this position? I mean, he is God, yes, but notice he highlights his death and his resurrection. He says, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And because of that, because I died and rose again, I have authority. I have the keys of death in Hades. And Hades is just, that's your common Greek word for the realm of the dead. Jesus is just simply saying, I have authority over death. I have authority over hell. Those realms are in my possession. Don't think of those as something outside of God's control. Jesus says, I own those. I possess those. I govern those. I can rescue people out of those. I went to the realm of death and became king over it by my resurrection so that I can rescue people from death and hell. So that thirdly, lastly, what does he do with this authority? We've been saying it all along. He takes care of his churches. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. He uses his authority to govern his church. And if you wonder why that language of the angels of the seven churches, are these guardian Angels, or maybe these are just human messengers, like pastors. I don't think it's either. I think it's somewhere in between. Often in scripture, angels put into effect in the earthly realm what God has decreed in the heavenly realm. They're his instruments, his servants, his messengers who put into effect what he has decreed. So to associate an angel with a church basically does this. It ties together heaven and earth. The point is the church isn't merely here on earth hoping God pays attention to us. We have a heavenly counterpart and Jesus rules over it all. We are, in a sense, already present in heaven. When we gather for worship, heaven and earth overlap. And as we go out into our daily lives, Jesus has a special concern for his people. So when you fear, like John did, when he heard the voice of Jesus, when he was startled, or when he went through these tough circumstances, when you fear, Jesus speaks good news, and he speaks comfort. He can also speak warnings. We can see that in Revelation 2 and 3. We're not going there this morning. He does warn the church, hey, you've gotten away from your mission, you lost your first love, and the danger is I might remove your candlestick. He says, or your lampstand, he says to the church at Laodicea, you become so self-sufficient, I'm on the outside looking in, that they threaten to lose this position of Christ drawing near to them. But to each one, 
He offers the opportunity to repent, to draw near to him, and he will walk among them once again. So what do we take away from all this? We take away this. What Christians in a hostile society need most is a vision of the glorified Jesus and ears to hear his comforting message. That is how the church will succeed in its work. That is how you will persevere in your witness. John was not on Patmos thinking, man, if I could, we could just scheme it and get a new emperor, everything would be better. If I could make contact with the right senator, he would go to bat on my behalf. No, John needed to see the risen Jesus. And that's what Jesus gave him. And that's what kept him going. And furthermore, let us notice how Jesus spoke to John. He spoke to him gently. He spoke to him with reassuring words of comfort. How do you speak to others when they are in need? Let us speak to others as Jesus does. Or maybe you look at someone like John, exiled for his faith, losing everything because of his religion. And you think, wow, that is foolish. Why give up so much for Jesus? Why did John have to be so obstinate? Why can't he just hold his faith privately and kind of go along with the flow? That's what the Romans often wonder. They just couldn't understand why these Christians were so stubborn. And in one of their writings, they refer to all these riots that are taking place because of Crestus. They didn't even know his name. They hardly knew who this Jesus was. They just couldn't understand why Christians acted that way. And maybe you see that and you wonder, why do Christians have to be so loyal to Jesus? Well, if Jesus is who he says he is. If this vision is real, not just some hallucination, and I think there's good reasons for believing it's real. If this is the one true and living God, then what other choice do Christians have? In fact, they dare not give their loyalty to anyone else than the risen Christ. So wherever you are, whatever your circumstances and whatever your background, what we need more than anything else this Christmas and throughout the year is to see and to hear this glorified Christ. He was the faithful witness. He persevered unto death. And now his victory is our victory. And in him, we persevere. So let's give thanks for that. And let's pray for God's grace together. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your all-sufficient grace. Thank you for King Jesus revealed to us here in the pages of Holy Scripture. Again, forgive us of when we sin against him and do not find in him everything we need. And thank you for your all-sufficient grace. We adore you for your glorious reign and we thank you for your mercy towards your people. And we pray that you would help us in all of our circumstances. Help us, like John, to bear faithful witness to Christ through our words and through our deeds, and to persevere when we suffer, whether that be antagonism for our faith, the personal trials of life that you ordain, or any other kind of suffering. May we know in those hours your presence, and may we trust and persevere as members of your kingdom. Give us that grace as individuals. Give us that grace corporately as a church. That we would be your witness, that we would be your presence here in the world. And thank you for how you do walk among us and care for us. And bless us now as we come to this time of baptism and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's sing before we come to the sacrament of baptism, hymn 226. As with gladness, men of old, hymn 226. I'll invite you to stand with me as we sing.
did, I'll make just a comment before Jennifer and Graham and Samuel come up. We have in the scriptures these promises from God in Acts 2.39. For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And in Genesis 17, I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And lastly, in Acts 16, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. We have the wonderful history in scripture of God saving sinners. He's been saving sinners since day one in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve first sinned against God. He made them promises and they believed them and they were rescued from their sin. And then when God called Abraham, he did something new. He had been saving sinners, but with Abraham, he organized a community of people who would be the visible body in which his saving promises would be handed down. And he saved Abraham. And then he said, now, Abraham, I want you to be circumcised and I want you to mark your children. I want there to be a community that hands down these promises by means of a mark throughout all the generations until God comes and fulfills his promises. And that's what we see happening there in the ministry of Jesus and the church. Circumcision looked forward to something. Your hearts need to be circumcised. God told the people, you need someone to come and save you and cleanse you from your sins. And that's why we find baptism taking circumcision's place in the New Testament. Now this salvation has come. Now this cleansing is available. Now the Spirit is being poured out from on high on his people. And so God continues to proclaim those promises to his people and to hand them down from generation by, to generation by visible signs. These signs do not save. Samuel will be as guilty of sin as he is after baptism as he is before it. He will still need to come to the point where he exercises faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do this in order to mark him as a member of the community. As a member of the one to whom the promises have been offered. And in the hope that he will embrace those promises. And perhaps embrace them in such a way. Where as he grows, he'll say, this is what I've heard all my life, and this is what I believe. And so we have the privilege then of exercising this sacrament today. So Jennifer and Graham, I ask you to come forward and bring Samuel with you. <laughs> that would be essential. Uh, he what? Is that how you hold them? No, it doesn't. Would you like to hold him? Sure. All right, very good. So in fact, Graham, if you would like to hold this. Um, sure. While I baptize, baptize him, you could. All right, so hold on that just for a second. I'm going to ask you a question. Three questions for the parents, and then I have a question for you, the congregation, as well. Jennifer and Graham, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you claim God's covenant promise in his behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do for your own? I do. And do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example and that you will pray with and for him and that, and that you will teach him uh, the doctrines of our holy religion and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And to the congregation, do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? If so, say, I do. I then it is my privilege to baptize you, Samuel Ray Brooks, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your many, many mercies towards us. We thank you for the promises of Holy Scripture that you will cleanse us from our sins 
and put a right spirit within us so that we may walk in your ways and be rescued from the wickedness of a system, of a world, and of our own hearts uh, that would drag us down to hell. Thank you for the mercies of God to come and to send your son to be born a baby and to live, die, and rise again on our behalf that we may be saved. I pray that you would give Jennifer and Graham all the grace they need to be good parents. And when they sin, to humbly rely on your grace, that they may be models of your grace and trust in you. And I pray for little Samuel that he may know the powerful working of your word in his midst. That as he comes to this church and as he hears the word, so you by your grace would shape his own faith to be one who knows the Savior and makes a good confession before many witnesses. Keep him from sin. Keep him from any danger. And may he know your grace. May the sacrament that we've observed today, the visible word, may it be powerful and effective. And may the Spirit be pleased to use the word to bring him to saving faith. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite all of you then to stand with me. Thank you, Jennifer and Graham. You can stay up here so people can come love on when you're done. And I invite you then to lift up your hands and your eyes and receive the blessing of God. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, You may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.